And our next speaker is uh, Dr. Joe Graves, Joseph Graves. He um, is a professor and has a joint um, appointment in the School of Nanoscience and Nanoengineering of North Carolina and North Carolina A and T State University and University of North Carolina also at, at Greensboro. He's a former graduate student here in the department, what used to be biology and now is EEB. And that was in the 80s. Uh, yeah, I'll, yeah. Tell, I'll talk and about that. And you talk about that. Okay. Yeah. Um, for those of you that have a little uh, understanding of the history of higher education in this country, North Carolina a and State University is the African-American version of North Carolina State. We're an 1890 land grant because in the former Confederate states, African-Americans couldn't attend the 1860 land grants. Now, uh, last night I had a dream. I, I really did. And I realized that one of the honors, and I've had a bunch of them since I left Michigan, but one of the honors uh, that's most relevant for this group to see is the one where I was named uh, one of the sensational 60, commemorating 60 years of the National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship. They chose one person each year of, of the years in which it existed to be the person representing the program. So those of you who know me from then know that that was 1979. That was the fellowship that brought me to Michigan. Now, if they had known what I did with it after I got here, <laughs> well, maybe they might have rescinded that honor. All right, so uh, for those of you not familiar with my work on um, biological and social conceptions of race, um, you can find that in, in two books. The Emperor's New Clothes um, is really a history of racial thinking in the Western world, how it came about. Um, and the race myth is more of, now that we understand that history, what are the ongoing pathologies that result from thinking in racial ways in modern society? Now, I'm also going to put up some other resources that a bunch of people here probably don't know about, because most of you are in agroecology and not um, anti-racist work directly. Uh, one of those, of course, is the three-part documentary, Race, Power of an Illusion. Um, part one is now somewhat dated. Um, it features uh, Richard Lewinton, uh, Stephen Jay Gould, myself, and of course, you know, I dominated that first part of the movie, even though Gould and Lewinton were in there, it was really about me, but that, that's all good. <laughs> and now the Encyclopedia of Race and Racism, which is in its second edition. And if you're familiar with the first edition, that was actually edited. Um, the lead editors were a bunch of European Americans. And so ask me what's wrong with having an encyclopedia of race and racism that is edited predominantly by persons of European descent. So they got wise, and they asked a bunch of African Americans and Latinos to edit the second version, and it's really much better. Um, the lead editor was Patrick Mason, who was also one of my co-workers in Black Action Movement 2. For those of you that don't know the history of this university, Black Action Movement 1 was the action that actually opened up the University of Michigan to African American students in greater numbers. Black Action Movement 2, which was led by Patrick and myself amongst uh, others, was what really started the hiring of African-American faculties on, on this campus in larger numbers. Now, I was the editor responsible for all the genetics, evolution, and anthropology um, parts of race and racism. Now, the quick talk that I'm going to give today actually follows a couple of my um, pieces. One that appeared in This View of Life in 2014 about uh, Nicholas Wade's book, uh, the paper uh, in uh, American Behavioral Scientists, Why the Non-Existence of Biological Races Doesn't Mean the Non-Existence of Racism, and Great is Their Sin, Biological Determinism in the Age of Genomics. So my interest in this topic really began here at Michigan 
and John Vandermeer was really the person who got me started. Again, for those people who knew me when I came here, they didn't know that I was really a broken person, that I had survived the racist ideology and practice of the American Academy, of the professors who I worked with and worked under, and I had internalized it. I believed that I was an inferior person, and I suffered a great deal. And what John gave me was an intellectual program that allowed me to fight back. And so that all that happened after in my career would not have happened if I hadn't met John. And, and that's just the truth. So I, you know, I'm telling him that. All right. So um, some of you know the definition of biological determinism, so I'm going to try to get through this really quick. Um, it's the assumption that there's a simple relationship between inherent biologic and genetic features of human beings and their position in society. Um, racist biological determinism uh, is the view that the relevant biologic feature is the purported race of the person in question, while biological determinism is ancient Racist biological determinism dates to the period of the European voyages of discovery. This ideology has played a key role in the subjugation of millions of people, probably hundreds of millions of people. For example, um, we're all, uh, or should be aware, of the dramatic increases in incarceration in American society since the 1930s. So if you looked at the rate of African Americans incarcerated at that time compared to European Americans, the ratio was three to one. Now, considering that this was a period of de jure racial segregation, three to one, it wouldn't have surprised anybody. However, in 1950, the ratio became four to one. In 1960, it was five to one. In 1970, six to one. 1989, when I got my PhD, seven to one, and I was almost one of them at that time. 2008, seven, zero, seven to one, and the ratio continues to increase. Clearly, we can't explain this rate uh, of incarceration due to genetic changes in the African-American population, although <laughs> don't laugh, because I was in Williams College uh, about a month ago with people exactly giving that explanation. So as silly as that might seem, people believe that. All right, another thing um, that's also something that people who don't really think about the impact of institutional racism on individual lives is that this has a real impact on mortality of African Americans compared to European Americans. So here you see me plotting the age-specific mortality rate of African Americans compared to European Americans. And I had a pointer. Uh, it disappeared, but I'll just walk. <laughs> That's the identity line. I, I learned how to do identity lines from John, too, by the way. <laughs> And there you have the ratios from 1963 to 2004. And so one of the things uh, that makes, brings us home is looking at the ratio at age 45 to 50, where it's 2.5 is that of European Americans. So why is this an important time? Well, this is the point when people are at the, should be at the peak of their career and their income earning potential. But if you're two and a half times more likely to be dead, well, then that's wealth that you don't in give to your family. And so when you look at the poorest people in, in American society, they're African-American women by orders of magnitude. So now, since racist biological determinism requires the existence of biological races, um, it's useful to try to understand what exactly this concept refers to. So, um, as I pointed out many times, making the claim that biological races exist within the human species should rest on the relevant biological facts. But this actually requires that you have a definition of what a biological race is. And one of the things I've noticed over the years is that those people who purport to believe that biological races exist in the human species don't ever give you a definition of exactly what a biological race is supposed to be. So, uh, Nicholas Wade, for example, defined races as, quote, clusters of variation in troublesome inheritance in 2014. Note that this definition differs from how evolutionary biologists have previously defined biological races or subspecies. That definition has been based upon the amount of genetic variation within and between groups, 
or whether cladistically unique evolutionary lineages could be identified within a species. So Charles Darwin actually recognized that humans probably didn't have biological races. So he talks about this in The Descent of Man, which was published in 1981. Now let us apply these generally admitted principles to the races of man, viewing him in the same spirit as a naturalist would view any other animal, and that's the key thing. If we were actually going to look at how biological variation is apportioned, we should be using the same intellectual program that we use for any other species. So Darwin described the racial multiplication problem in which two to 63 races could be named depending upon the traits you used. He also called human races protean or polymorphic and recognized that the physical differences used by naturalists to define races could have no significance because if they did, natural selection would remove them a long time ago. Now, Ernst Meyer also recognized this problem. The concept of subspecies is fallacious. Species are not composites of uniform subtypes or subspecies, but consist of an almost infinite number of local populations, each in turn, and sexual species consisting of genetically different individuals. The difficulty of the subspecies concept are intensified if one considers the subspecies not merely as a practical device of the taxonomist, but also as a unit of evolution. The better the geographical variation of the species is known, the more difficult it becomes to delimit subspecies and the more obvious it becomes that many such delimitations are quite arbitrary. So this is from Population Species and Evolution, which was written in 74. I got five minutes, all right. So here's biological definitions of race. I'm going to skip that. And I'm going to talk to you really quickly about how we can demonstrate that these claims are just totally nonsensical. So um, Sewell Wright um, developed a population subdivision statistic whose definition is given here. And basically, this is, allows you to look at the amount of genetic variation within the total species versus any arbitrarily defined subgroup. So when we do that for anatomically modern humans, we, found, we find that population subdivision in our species is extremely weak. So this is a study that Alan Templeton did back in 2002. You have guessed that the black bar represents anatomically modern humans. Now Wright's um, FST value can take on the value between 0 and 1, where you have to be greater than 0.250 or 1 quarter of the way to claim the existence of a geographic race. Now, this was not done arbitrarily because there's a probabilistic argument about fixation of genes in particular groups that follows from that. So here's anatomically modern humans, okay, less than 1.5, okay, 0.156 in this study. And this, of course, also depends upon how you look at variation. So if you look at non-coding regions, you're going to see much higher values of FSD, and that's because... Um, deleterious mutations are not acted upon by natural selection, so you can accumulate far more genetic variation in those regions compared to coding regions. Now, from the point of view of a racist biological determinist, you're really actually more interested in the coding regions because you're talking about things that lead to traits that characterize individuals. And so when we look at the coding regions, FST values are tiny across the human genome. So we just can't, again, support racist biological determinism if we look at the amount of population variation within and between groups in the human species. Now, people have actually looked at this across the entire species, and we can show that when we do this, um, if we look to barriers to gene flow, these only account for 1% of the variance in FST values. But isolation by distance accounts for 70% of the variation. And essentially what this looks like um, here, if you don't mind, is that people who live closest to each other share the most genes in common. And this is a continuum across the entire human species. So where would you arbitrarily, <laughs> no, two minutes, draw the existence of these biological races? So my colleague Sarah Tiskoff, in a study that was published in Science a few years back, did this with a large number of genetic markers looking at humans all over the world. And here's the take-home message. First off, as you probably all know, 
most of the genetic variation in anatomically modern humans is in sub-Saharan Africans. So if we get rid of the rest of y'all, we would still be fine. <laughs> not that I'm like advocating that. I'm not. Because, you know, I like a little bit of variety. So no, I don't want to get rid of it. But anyway, the bottom line is these are all statistically significant runs of the structure algorithm. So which one do you want to choose? You want two great races? Do you want seven? You want 11? You want 14? Take choice. And all that tells you then is you really don't have any biological races. So I'm uh, going to end um, with an example of why it's important for people like me to exist. So in 2014, after the publication of Nicholas Wade's book, I was giving a lecture on the genomics of evolutionary convergence at Stanford Center for Computational and Evolutionary Genetics. My hosts were Dr. Marcus Feldman and Noah Rosenberg. So we discussed Wade's book and how they felt their work was being misrepresented. So I looked Noah right in the eye and I said, Noah, if you think that Wade is misrepresenting your work, you have an obligation to say so. And shortly afterward, a letter went around to those of us who do genetics. Once you've assigned it, it appeared in the New York Times. I can say that I believe that if I hadn't been at that dinner, if I hadn't called Feldman and Rosenberg out on sitting back and doing nothing, then that letter probably would have never happened. A similar example of this is the article that appeared in Science earlier this year. Um, both of these people are people I know. I went over this draft with Sarah Tishkoff. And again, it's important for people like me to be in science, and I'm out of time. <laughs> but I'll show you one of my genomic papers, just so you know. I, I actually do do genomics. <laughs> But no questions.